Welcome to the Daily Office Lectionary. I'm Father Reed. This week, we're going to look at Proper 15. Proper 15. Now, what does that mean, particularly if you're joining me for the first time, first or second or third time? We are in the season of Pentecost, and in liturgical churches, there are two major seasons. The first one is from Advent through Pentecost, and that includes Advent, Christmas. Advent would begin at the end of November, the 1st of December, and it would go to Christmas, then Epiphany at the turn of the year, to Lent, and then Easter, and then Pentecost. And the second half, and that's about six months, and the second half of the year is about six months, and that runs from um, about uh, June through uh, November. And we count that off as the Sundays after Pentecost. But since Pentecost is a movable date, because Easter is a movable date, uh, we go by the name proper, okay? So we are in proper 15, and we are looking in the Old Testament in Judges, and we begin the book of Job, the great book of Job. Amazing book. We continue in the New Testament with Acts, and thirdly, the gospel reading is a continuation of John. So as I said to you last week, we have long stretches of scriptures uh, in the second half of the liturgical season, the season after Pentecost, the Sundays after Pentecost. And so we find the book of John that we're looking at, the book of Acts that we're looking at through the summer, and we have the Old Testament reading uh, in Judges and in Job. Now, Judges is completely different from Job, so let's define again what Judges is. Judges comes after Joshua, which comes after the five books of, the first four, five books of Moses called the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And afterwards is Joshua. Joshua is going to take the people uh, that he is leading, and he is going to be a military commander, and he is going to be used by God, with God's help, of course. God is going to fight for them, the famous verse. And he is going to um, drive out the nations that are in the land of what is now present-day Israel. Why is he going to do that? Because that land was promised by God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that is the land that the Israelites were promised by God, and Joshua is the person appointed by God to lead an exposition, armies, against those people and drive them out. Now, Judges is the consequence of them winning those battles and dividing the land that they conquered into 12 sections, 12, the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? And so we were talking about Judges last week. Let's continue on. In chapter 16, we have the famous Samson and Delilah, the Samson and Delilah story, where Delilah is trying to figure out Samson, who is a judge, who has come against the Philistines, Philistines very strongly, and they can't stop him. She's trying to figure out the secret of his strength. He finally, it very unwittingly, not very smart at all, foolishly, he finally tells them in verse 17 of chapter 16. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I've been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, verse 18, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines. They came back. And they cut his hair. They gouged his eyes out. He became blind. Look at what it says in verse 20. So poignant. He did not know that the Lord had left him. The Lord had left him. And so his strength shriveled up. He was just like any other man. And it says in the second half of chapter 16, which is part of our reading, that he was led uh, out into a temple. Bring out Samson to entertain us, in verse 25. So they called Samson out of the prison and he performed for people. When they 
stood him among the pillars. Samson said to the servants who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. And the temple was crowded with men and women, and all the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof, there were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Large number of people in the temple. Then Samson prayed. He prayed to God. And Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, embracing himself against them, his right hand on the one, his left hand on the other. Let me die with the Philistines, he says. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he had killed more when he died than while he lived. He led Israel for 20 years. A tragic story. And when the people got in trouble, Judges chapter 2, which we spoke about last week, when the people got in trouble, they called on the Lord, and the Lord heard their cry and raised up a person to save them. And Samson was one of those people. There's a wonderful story in chapter 17, and 18, Micaiah's idols and the Danites settle in Laish. And please um, read that. I want to draw your attention to two things. Uh, 17.6, in those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. No king, no leader. The people sinned against God. When things got bad and things got out of place, they called upon God. They repented. God raised up a judge, they called him, to save them, a mighty leader. Man or woman. Deborah was a woman, obviously, and did a lot of great work as a judge. But the people went back after the judge died and, or after their leadership ended. Look at chapter 18, verse 1. In those days, Israel had no king. Now, if you would read into Samuel, which we're not looking forward to doing, we're going to be looking at Job in a couple of, minutes, a couple of seconds, actually. Um, they wanted a king. They wanted a king to rule them. What did God want? God wanted to rule the people himself. We call that a theocracy. People would have nothing to do with it. So enjoy reading uh, 17 and 18, two more stories uh, from the book of Judges, and um, uh, just it, it was really a calamitous time where the people were just kind of doing their own thing and their worship of God wasn't very sincere and their love of God was not very sincere. Uh, God could have left, let them over to the nations, but he didn't do it. If he had, they would have gone under. They wouldn't have survived it. Enjoy. Now, the book of Job is one of the more fascinating books of the Bible. We don't know when it was written. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know the time frame. There's so many different views on Job. It's a very, very difficult book in terms of its origin and its writing. But in terms of what it's about, it's not that difficult. It's actually very, very profound literature, very profound poetry, if you will, some text. And the whole idea revolves around a person named Job. And you'll see this in the first chapter. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. He was a very, very godly person. And there's this tete-a-tete that the Lord had with Satan in verse 8. And God says, hey, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Ah, yes. But if you take a blessing from him and you allow me to do some work in terms of messing up his life... I don't think he's going to be so upright and godly. God, if you allow me to do some damage, I think this guy is going to turn against you. And the Lord said, okay, you can do it, just don't kill him. And Job got smashed by the devil, Satan himself. And, uh, and then now we have to deal with that. Look at the end of 22, chapter 1, and all this Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. He hadn't indicted God yet. Chapter 2. On another day, verse 1, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Well, I've been roaming the whole earth. Have you considered my servant Job? He maintains his integrity, even though what, what you've done to him. And he said, Well, a man will give all he has for his own life. Verse 4. But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you. 
Okay, he's in your hands, but spare his life. Can't kill him. And so Satan, again, puts him in a very difficult situation. Now, Job then at the end of two has three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And they heard all of his troubles, and they met with him to comfort him and to sympathize with him, the Bible says in verse 11. But when they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. And they sat on the ground for seven days and seven nights. They didn't say a word because they knew how great his suffering was. So Job is suffering very much. And so chapter 3, our last book that we're looking at for this week, proper 15, Job opened his mouth and he cursed the day of his birth. He finally turned against God. He had done pretty well for a while, but the pain, the pain became so unbearable. He was just going, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? May the day of my birth perish. In the, in the night it was said, a boy is born. That day, may it turn to darkness. Beautiful poetry, verse 4. May God above not care about it. May no light shine upon it. And finish the reading. Now, we'll be looking at Job for several weeks, and we will be considering what God is saying to Job. And we'll see that in the 38th chapter, what Job is saying about his situation, what his three friends are saying. And so it, the, the discussion about evil, the discussion about turning against God, the discussion is why does God allow evil, the, the discussion about why does God allow suffering, those are all fabulous subjects that the book of Job deals with. You're going to enjoy the book of Job, even if you've read it many times. So enjoy. The book of Acts. We are now in Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, 44, we were dealing with uh, Stephen's speech to the Sanhedrin last week. And uh, he is finishing his diatribe, if you will. And what happens at the end, let's see, we've got Acts 7, 44 to 8, 1. 7, 44 to 8, 1. When they heard this, verse 54, after he had finished, it was a serious diatribe too. Stephen, full of the Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing in the right hand of God. Look, I see heaven open and the Son of God, Son of Man, standing at the right hand of God. And they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So they killed Stephen. Remember, I told you last week that the... Seventh chapter is a recapitulation of Israel's history, so it's wonderful, quite wonderful. And Stephen, our first martyr, uh, uh, the death of Stephen, I believe that we celebrate uh, his martyrdom at the end of December. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, he says. And then he cries out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. When he said this, he fell asleep the great Stephen. Now, this man, Saul, becomes Paul, but at the time, he was very much against people like Stephen. In chapter 8 of the book of Acts, the whole chapter, we have readings regarding the persecution of the church, Philip in Samaria, Simon the sorcerer, the one that wants all this great power. You're going to enjoy that reading, beginning at verse 9. And Simon wanted the power that was given when the apostles laid hands on people and he offered them money. Have you ever heard of the word simony? S-I-M-O-N-Y. It has something to do with this text here in chapter 8. He said he saw the work that Peter and James had done when they placed their hands on them and they said, give me this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands receive, may receive the Holy Spirit. But yeah, but he wanted something for that. And so that's why Peter said in verse 20, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Your heart is not right before God. So you cannot do this. Okay? Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Verse 22. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Then we have the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. 
This is a person, this is kind of very miraculous teaching here. Um, so what he, what's happening in Acts right now is that we are uh, sharing what's going on in the church and how God is using people in the church and how God is ministering to people in the church and saving people and doing some very miraculous things. So enjoy the end of chapter 8. And of course, one of the great chapters in the Bible, one of the most important chapters in the Bible is Acts chapter 9, and this is the conversion of Saul. Now, Saul was a very smart person, and he thought he was doing the will of God. This is a classic example of someone that thought they were doing the will of God, but in fact, they were not. And what he was doing is he was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples in verse 1. So he goes to the high priest and he asks him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that, he found, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So as he got near Damascus, he saw a light from heaven flash. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, a lot of people said he fell off his horse. There's no indication that he was, fell off his horse, although that's probable. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And now begins, in my view, the most important person in the history of the world outside of Jesus. Saul, who later became Paul, who wrote 13 letters that we have in the Bible, from Romans to Philemon, or Philemon, who changed the face of Christianity by his extraordinary missionary work that we'll see in, in Acts, and who raised up leaders for the church that changed the world. And so you will very much enjoy reading the book of Acts chapter 9 through 19a, which talks about what is now going to happen. So we'll see the life of Ananias, who's going to play a role in this, who is going to sh pray with him. And God is going to empower and bless Paul and use him in a tremendously uh, important way. So in chapter 8, we have ministry going on in Samaria. In chapter 9, we have the persecution of the church, which is serious, and Paul desires to do greater damage. But remember this, people. The person that's in charge is the Lord. He is ultimately in charge. He has all the power. He unleashes it by changing Paul's life in midstream. This is why I always say, when you see or meet someone that's relationship with God is not very good and it doesn't look like they're going to turn to the Lord, I always have hope because people like Saul have been miraculously turned around and it can happen again. John's Gospel, chapter 5. We are working ourselves through John, chapter 5, verse 19. And we have the wonderful uh, text that uh, Jesus is at the temple and he is um, speaking to the Jews and he is sharing the gospel with them. And these words are just, I could almost read every single one of them. They're so important. 19 through 29. He has entrusted all judgment to the Son, chapter 5, 22b, second half of verse, the verse in 22. I tell you the truth, verse 24, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. And he has all the authority, all the judgment is there. And salvation is about being in Christ. I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Chapter 5, verse 30. He goes all the way in our reading to the end of uh, chapter 5. How can you believe, verse 44, if you accept praise from one another, yet make no effort to obtain the praise that comes from the Holy God? In John, as I've mentioned to you before, we see lots of evidence of Jesus going back and forth with the leaders uh, of Judaism. And they can't understand what he's talking about. And so he has these long um, diatribes, if you will, of sharing with them, sometimes coming against them harshly about what they believe and why they believe it and speaking the truth about who he is. In chapter 6, 
one of the great chapters of the Bible. Uh, it's about um, the feeding of the 5,000 in verses 1 through 15. It's one of the few miracles that's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, some commentators say the only uh, instance where all four Gospels record one, at least one miracle all together. And so we have the great feeding of the 5,000, uh, a, a truly astonishing miracle uh, from God. And then Jesus walks on water. A lot of people have heard about that. There it is in the Bible. If you created the universe and if you're God, you can walk on water, okay? And I have never had a problem with him walking on water or feeding the 5,000. And, of course, feeding the 5,000 were only the men. We did not include the women and children, so there's probably fifteen to 20,000 people there, which is, again, an astonishing miracle. Jesus walks on water, again, given his power and his greatness. And in chapter uh, 6, we continue on with Jesus talking about being the bread of life. The work of God is this, verse 29, to believe in the one he has sent. Okay? And so he's going to say in the famous 35th verse, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. And so he is come down from heaven, verse 38, not to do his will, but the will of him who sent me. So why is Jesus here? He's here to provide water and, and uh, food for all of us, but it's spiritual. It's not physical. We'll die physically eventually. But what he has for us is spiritual and has eternal value to it. And so we see when the feeding of the 5,000, it's an amazing miracle. Then we have the walking on water, which is an amazing miracle. And then he has this wonderful explication in the book of uh, John chapter 6 about being the bread of life, about being the one that's going to sustain us and hold us and is going to fill us. He says in verse 47, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. He's the only one that can impart that kind of life to us. So you've got some beautiful readings from John, uh, which are just, just stunning. I love John so much. And from Acts, you have the major work that the Holy Spirit is doing in the church, beginning in the end of chapter 7 with Stephen's martyrdom. And then we have some, a series of uh, miracles in chapter 8. Uh, and a person that's trying to use the gifts of the Spirit, uh, Simon, uh, that gets rebuked by Peter. And then in chapter 9, of course, the great uh, Saul becomes Paul and is going to be used by God to do great things. In Judges, we have uh, several stories, one uh, the most famous being Samson. And then we begin with the book of Job in the Old Testament where Satan asks God permission to deal with Job in such a way that he's going to want Job to turn against God based on his misery. And he does, beginning in the third chapter. And again, enjoy the poetry. So bringing all three together, I think you'll have a wonderful time of learning, I pray, and prayer and reflection. God bless you. We'll be next week, we'll be looking at Proper 16. Enjoy your reading. <music>